Welcome to episode 115 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Dan Frost, and this episode was recorded on April 10th, 2024. Today we are going to add to the series of fibers by talking about nylon. And then at the end, I have all the information about this year's Shetland Hogmanay box. Let's get started. It is early here as I record this, so I do apologize. I'm sitting here in my office. Uh, it's 6 a.m. <laughs> I've been awake for an hour and a half because that's just how my brain works sometimes. And it's been so silent in the house, but as I'm sitting here starting to record, the birds are starting to wake up. So it looks on my computer that it's catching some of the sounds of them singing outside my window. Maybe not. Maybe when I go back to edit this, it's just going to be silence, but it's entertaining to me in the moment. <laughs> I wrote much of this episode several months ago, and it didn't end up being enough to fill a full episode, so my initial plan was to use it with another topic that also didn't quite fill a full episode. But that was three full episodes ago, and I still have this fragment of a show floating around. Plus, I am coming up to crunch time with this first semester of my program. Spring break came and went and I used it to get caught up on life and work rather than putting the time into the last major project. And now I have less than two weeks to get done what I should have been doing over five. <laughs> so I've decided to just add a few more thoughts to this fragment of an episode and maybe have a shorter than normal show and then I'm going to semi-disappear until May while I take care of this ginormous assignment. A few months ago, in the course of about a week, I had half a dozen people talk to me about the episode I did about acrylic as part of the series on fiber types. For those of you who may be new to the podcast and haven't listened to old episodes, you can find that as episode 99. Everyone who brought it up to me had a different reason for doing so, and I decided I needed to go back and listen to it again myself and remind myself what I said. Um, I got a little spicy. What can I say? When I get a bee in my bonnet, the bee's going to get an earful. <laughs> but one of the things I was reminded of in listening to episode 99 was that I mentioned that the different synthetic fibers behave differently and that I'd address the most popular ones separately in another episode. So today we're going to talk about nylon. But before we do, I want to share a quote that a friend sent to me the other day. It's part of a talk from the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichia. I'm going to censor it slightly, and I recognize the irony of that given the context of the quote, but this is a show that has a history of being a swear-free zone, and I know some of you listen on speakers with little ones around. Suffice it to say in the original quote, when, when I say, this is bull, I am shortening that last word. Otherwise, the quote is intact. Okay. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie said, I think that what our society teaches young girls, and I think it's also something that's quite difficult for even older women, self-confessed feminists to shrug off, is the idea that likability is an essential part of the space you occupy in the world. That you're supposed to twist yourself into shapes to make yourself likable. That you're supposed to kind of hold back sometimes, pull back, don't quite say, don't be too pushy, because you have to be likable. And I say, that is bull. And so what I want to say to young girls is, forget about likability. If you start off thinking about being likable, you're not going to tell your story honestly, because you're going to be so concerned with not offending. And that's going to ruin your story. So forget about likability. And also the world is such a wonderful, diverse, multifaceted place that there's somebody who's going to like you. You don't need to twist yourself into shapes. End of quote. And you might wonder why I'm sharing that quote today when I'm about to talk about nylon, of all things. So let me explain. 
There is a growing trend on social media among some of the influencers that I frankly find to be like a little disturbing, like, and disturbing is a strong word. It's a little, a little disturbing. And that trend is to create content that paints people in the community who are trying to educate others about the choices they are making with their dollars as being elitist or mean or judgy. And that they have, in contrast, cultivated a safe space where you can craft without judgment or nagging about your choices because they are not mean. They are accepting of all. They are willing to be likable and encourage no growth and no improvement. And I find that to be eye-rollingly misguided, but it is the easiest thing to do, this telling people what they want to hear, because social media is literally about being likable. So when people with pretend authority, and that's what most of us are, is pretend authorities, tell you that there's nothing negative about what you're doing and you don't need to maybe change a habit, that's really likable. Click the heart as fast as you can. What I and others in the crafting community are doing when we create educational content like this is not being mean or judgy. We are educating and we're being direct about it because we trust that you have the capacity to understand issues and make informed choices when presented with information. If you go back to episode 99, I think I even say, don't throw away the acrylic you have. It already exists in the world, and chucking it is not going to improve things at this point. But synthetic fibers are not the best choice in 99.9% .9 of situations. They are not the best option for the purpose of the item being made. They're not the best option for the recipient's needs. They're often not the safest choice. And long-term, they're not even the best option financially when the item is going to get crustier and stiffer with repeated washings and it ends up being tossed because the initial feeling has changed and no one wants to use it anymore. The cost issue is especially true when you can put some extra thought into your purchase and get a natural fiber alternative at a comparable price. Not to mention that synthetic fibers are artificially cheap for us because the costs are borne by those we don't come into contact with every day. And a cutesy cutesy reel or a post does not change that and it does not improve this situation. It does not inform people about this topic. It's like saying, hey, don't let people tell you asbestos isn't the best insulator. You go ahead and line your whole house with it. I won't judge. So, fine. If talking about the very real dangers and drawbacks of synthetic fibers makes me unlikable in the fiber space, so be it. But I'm not going to sugarcoat things for people and celebrate petroleum-based yarns. If you have them, use them up but I'm going to continue making the case for why they are far from ideal and natural fibers are better in the areas of health, safety, your finances, the environment, and the purpose of the finished item itself. And if you don't like that, that's okay. There are a dozen people out there willing to tell you what you want to hear for every one of me and people like me. I know that. But I'm going to continue to make the case for improving your craft and for making better choices with your money. And I would love it if you would stick around and hear me out. So back to the case at hand, <laughs> we are going to talk about nylon today. A lot of what I said about acrylic also holds true with things like nylon and polyester. And in fact, I'm making the executive decision now to not do a polyester episode between how acrylic and nylon behave, polyester is like 5% different. So I don't feel like it needs another episode and I have more fibers I wanna get to. Anyway, acrylic, nylon, polyester, they're all derived from fossil fuels. Their production takes place in the developing world where environmental restrictions are much more lax and their creation involves the production of byproducts that have direct negative impacts on the people who work and live in and around those factories. When they are at the end of their life, they take hundreds of years to decompose, adding toxins to the ground as they go. These are no small issues. They are not something we should be poo-pooing away as we consider our yarn choices. 
We talk about fiber choices and we make excuses like that our baby projects should be done in acrylic so it can be machine washable. And we ignore the fact that if the baby is wearing that and there's a fire, acrylic will catch easily and melt to the baby. We talk about synthetics adding durability when nearly the same, if not the same, durability can be achieved through natural fibers. But the real conversation killer, in America at least, is to bring up the cost. If you say people shouldn't use synthetic fibers, then you're accused of excluding the poor from being able to craft. No. There are lots of ways to acquire natural fiber yarns affordably, and arguing for the use of synthetic fibers is ignoring the real consequences of their manufacture on the global poor. All of that said, I know a lot of us have nylon in our stashes already. And again, I don't think you should just chuck these things if you have them. And if we are going to use them up, let's put them to the best use we can so that the finished item has its longest, happiest life and doesn't end up in landfill in short order. So let's talk about nylon. Nylon was first manufactured in the 1930s and was used as a silk substitute. You may sometimes see it listed on a label as polyamide. There are also other ways to create polyamides. Polyamides are just like a designation. There are actually natural polyamides too, but oftentimes when you see polyamide, that's just another word for nylon when we're talking about yarn labels. Uh, Nylon is a synthetic polymer that is typically produced in a fibrous form. It can, it can be made stiff and hard or very soft. And because it's possible to make it into a soft fiber, it's often mixed with wools and other natural fibers to increase their durability. Nylon is machine washable and adding nylon to other fibers like wool is one way that wool can be prevented from shrinking, but that is not the only way. Nylon is resistant to water, which means that adding it to wool reduces its ability to transfer heat and moisture away from your body. Wool is so remarkable, though, that it can keep working well enough until the nylon content is getting up there, like 30% or more. Pure nylon, however, is like wearing a plastic bag. Your sweat isn't going anywhere, which is why I laugh at so many performance fabrics out there that brag about being moisture wicking, but in reality, they should say they're moisture holding because they achieve the wicking action by having grooves in the fibers, the moisture gets wicked into those grooves, and then it just sits there against your skin, being gross because it traps more moisture against you. Nylon yarns and yarns with high amounts of nylon get stinkier faster and need to be washed more than many natural fiber alternatives. Because it tends to resist water, a lot of rain jackets these days are made of nylon, but they don't tend to stay waterproof for long because nylon is only water resistant, not water impervious. So a nylon raincoat is good for maybe 20 minutes in a light rain and less in a heavier rain. Because it resists water, pure nylon can sometimes just be wiped clean instead of having to be washed. However, grease stains on nylon often need additional spot treatment and care to remove. And that is the case when nylon is blended with other fibers as well. Nylon will catch fire and burn at lower temperatures than both cotton and wool. It's not going to burst into flames on your body but exposure to flame for a few seconds will cause it to catch and then the fire will spread. And rather than burning to ash like natural fibers, it melts and can stick to anyone who happens to be wearing it, which makes it a dangerous fiber to wear in its pure form or as the dominant fiber in a blend. However, wool is so good at suppressing fires that I learned recently that adding just 30% of wool to any flammable fiber is enough to make it fire retardant. So a low nylon content wool blend is probably not the end of the world for garments, but really do take care when choosing yarn for clothing, especially for young ones, because any yarn that is predominantly derived from a fossil fuel synthetic will burn and will melt to the wearer. I know people sort of scoff at that and they say, what are the chances of something like that happening? And I will say that in my own lifetime, Uh, A neighbor a few years older than me had an incident with a faulty Bunsen burner in science class that resulted in third-degree burns. 
I know people who have been involved in car accidents with fire involved, kids play with matches, faulty wiring happens, neighbors' cooking fuel tanks burn down entire communities. Uh, I know of fires that have affected actual people in my life in these ways. None of them expected it. Accidents are called accidents for a reason. Um, While we're talking about fire, I'm just going to step off of this soapbox and onto another one for a moment and say, please stop doing burn tests on your mystery fibers. Burning nylon releases hydrogen cyanide. You don't need to be huffing that to see if your mystery fiber is wool or synthetic. Cut a length of the yarn about a foot long, untwist it, and have a good look at the fibers themselves in sunlight. Look for unnaturally shiny fibers and fibers that are inexplicably long, and that will give you your answer in most cases that there is at least some synthetic content in the yarn. Once you see whether there are synthetics, you can play around a little more. Drop some of the yarn in a bowl of water and push it under the surface. If it resists the water for a bit, it's most likely wool. If it absorbs right away, it's most likely plant-based. If it does resist, look at it carefully again. If it's very smooth and shiny, there's a possibility that it's mercerized cotton rather than wool. That also will sort of delay the how fast it absorbs water if it's cotton, if it's been mercerized. If it feels a little heavy compared to an equal amount of known wool yarn, then it's likely a mercerized cotton. Cotton's just heavier, you know, size by size, ounce for ounce. I mean, why do we say ounce for ounce? They're both ounces, so they're going to be the same, but I think you know what I mean. None of this advice is exact, but it's about as exact as a burn test, and it won't result in you breathing in toxic fumes while you burn your piece of yarn over and over trying to analyze burn times and ash quality. Okay, back to nylon. Adding 10 to 20% of nylon to wool brings the cost down while adding durability for most breeds of wool without affecting the softness. It prevents the wool from shrinking, as I mentioned, and it's both easy to dye and color fast once it has been dyed. People get very excited about being able to wash wool with nylon blended with it, but every time it is washed, it's releasing microplastics into the environment. For more on how that affects things, I'll direct you again to the acrylic episode, which was episode 99. And as we talk about how positive it is to be able to wash nylon fibers um, and send them through the dryer, Oftentimes, people don't realize that they need to be drying wool nylon blends on a cool setting because repeated dryings can cause low-grade melting of the nylon. Um, This is true for any synthetic fibers. We talk about the washability of these man-made fibers, but we don't talk about how repeated dryings often make them melt slightly, which over time results in them developing a slightly crusty feel, which is really unpleasant. Um, And you definitely do not want to iron anything made with nylon or another man-made synthetic. Environmentally, nylon's production requires large amounts of water that, again, because it tends to take place in areas of the world where laxer environmental rules are the law of the land, it's released into areas where people are using the polluted water for bathing, laundry, and consumption, and they are suffering health consequences from it. For those of you who are trying to reduce your impact on global warming and greenhouse gases, the production of nylon releases large amounts of nitrous oxide, which pound for pound has an impact on warming the atmosphere that is 265 times worse than carbon dioxide. This is from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. At this point in time, Nylon only makes up about 5% of textiles in the world. But because it is so popular a fiber to blend into yarns, as fiber crafters, we encounter it a lot. This is why it's important to be educated about the impacts the production of nylon has on the world. This is a situation where we as fiber crafters can actually make a big difference. But we need to know about these effects so we can make informed choices. People often ask about alternatives for nylon, so let's stop highlighting the negatives and just talk about your options. A lot of synthetic fibers out there in the world are being made simply because they're cheaper alternatives. 
There are natural fibers that can do what they do well enough to get a good long use out of the product and still allow it to biodegrade at the end of its life. Be more selective when you shop and be willing to make a minor repair now and then and you can do without nylon in your crafting. Yes, even you sock knitters of the world. Choose a more durable fiber for one thing. I love merino. Merino is lovely and soft against the skin, but that doesn't mean it's the most logical choice for socks. In fact, it's kind of a poor choice for socks, which is why it tends to be blended with nylon. Look for stronger wool breeds to make your socks with. The type that's really catching on for sock yarns these days is Blueface Lester, which has a slightly thicker fiber with a longer staple length. Plus, it's naturally less likely to felt because it doesn't have those surface scales needed for the fibers to lock into place with each other to form felt. Some producers are blending mohair with wool to add durability that way. Upspunny Mini Mill in Iceland has been producing sock yarns that are the undercoat of the Icelandic sheep blended with some of the outer coat to get that added strength. They even have a type of sock yarn that is just the outer coat. To be honest, I find that one to be more coarse, no surprise there, but if you don't have sensitive feet, socks knit from that will last you for forever and a day. Finding yarns with a higher twist to them can also increase their durability. Pick up the Fleece and Fiber Source book at the bookstore or Amazon or from your local library and learn about your options for natural fibers that will match the project you have in mind without needing to be supplemented with added nylon. Look for wools that resist felting naturally. Choose those or cotton or linen for baby projects. Choose stronger wools and softer wools blended with stronger natural fibers like silk, linen, or mohair for items that need additional durability. Nylon comes with a few perks for crafters, but a whole lot of negatives. Don't turn a blind eye to those negatives. Make wise choices about what you craft with, use up what you have, and don't buy more. Ask your favorite dyers to produce products on solely natural fiber bases. Buy less and purposefully so you can afford better quality when you do buy new yarn. What do I mean by buy less and purposefully? We talk about how acquiring yarn and using yarn are two different hobbies. And I totally understand that that can be two different things as I sit here in my office with a china cabinet full of yarn behind me to display part of my stash and a bowl of yarn visible on my craft table acting as a piece of decor. But there is another thing we laugh about called acquiring stash beyond life expectancy. I am in my office right now and all of my yarn is stored in this room. It's not a massive room. I would say it's the size of a typical American child's bedroom. And as I look around at the storage space in my room that I have filled with yarn, I would not say that I have hit stash beyond life expectancy, but I would say that if I stopped buying yarn today and just knit from stash, I would have yarn for 12 years at least. I might even be able to get to 15. And that all fits comfortably in this room. That's not resorting to rubber made bins in the basement. It's not your responsibility to keep Red Heart or the big box craft stores in business. Just because you like the color and it's cheap doesn't mean that you have to bring it home and store it for 20 years. Buy less. Buy with a project in mind or to support a farmer or small business or to buy with an eye to really curate a collection of yarn. You don't need to buy every hot pink yarn you see, or whatever your favorite color is. You don't need to buy every limited edition from your favorite dyer. Buy less, with purpose, and your overall budget for yarn will improve, and you will likely be able to afford some nicer yarns that aren't relying on synthetics to bring the price down. Personally, I have steadily been working my way through my nylon content yarn and have been avoiding getting more. Because I don't knit socks, there isn't really anything I have that requires that much added durability. And at this point, I'd be happy to use something blended with linen or mohair when I do need that additional durability rather than nylon. We aren't going to be perfect. We have purchases we've already made. We have times when we're going to forget to check the labels. But we can resolve to do better and take a moment to stop and think about what we're actually buying and supporting the production of rather than letting impulse guide us. 
And please, if you are going to knit with some nylon in the fiber content, please stop sending it through a hot dryer because you're just destroying it quicker. There, I hope that was helpful and likable. (laughs) But if not, oh well. (laughs) I have a song for you before we wrap things up. I don't know how things are going where you live, but around here we've had several days that have given me faith that we have crossed out of winter and are really in for true heading for summer. So let's have a little pop today. This is Kai Dreams and Wild Heart with Half Your Heart. I feel like I'm afraid to say how I feel, to know I let you down. Cause late nights turn to days, don't wanna let you down. With each breath we give away, it'll never be the same. I'm chasing somebody who won't ever ease the pain But I don't want half of your heart, heart, heart You can have it back If it's only, only half of your heart A few more things before I go. Speaking of acquiring yarn, (laughs) I wanted to get this episode out so I could give you all the details of the Shetland Hogmanay box before they go up for sale this Saturday, April 13th at noon Eastern, 5 p.m. British time. This is the third iteration of the box, and there are some companies you may be familiar with, but I've also brought in some new makers to supply some of the surprises. Through this week, I've been sharing details about each of the box contributors on my social media account, so hop over to Facebook or Instagram to get those details. Terry Laura is returning as the designer for the box this year. She has a pattern for us that is a gender-neutral, wearable winter accessory that has been designed to use the yarns included in the box. The yarn this year will come from Uradale Yarns, Laxdale Yarn, Aster Oo, Jamesons of Shetland, and the Silly Sheep Fiber Company. All of the balls of yarn will be 25 grams of 100% Shetland raised wool, all from family-owned businesses. Likewise, the surprise inclusions all come from family or individual-owned businesses. There are some new names included this year, but even the returning participants have new offerings for us. We will have items from Papperwark Furniture, Pink Fish Shetland, Donna Smith Designs, Mella Handmade Soap, Up House Crafts, Mackenzie's Farm Shop, and Glance and Glass. Each year I tweak the design of the box a bit. Um, This year I will be providing a limited version of the pattern early on in the box for those who want to start knitting the project after the first few days. It will not spoil the upcoming contents of the box, but it will allow you to get started if you want to make this your December knitting project. 
At the end of the box, you will receive a color printed full version of the pattern along with a QR code that will allow you to download a digital version. The Sears box is 270 US dollars. This price includes the cost of shipping anywhere you are in the world. So that's not 270 plus shipping, that is 270 with the shipping included. The box will ship in mid-October from Shetland to allow plenty of time for it to arrive by December 1st. And I will say, as far as I know, everyone received their boxes uh, on time for the last two years. Uh, it was very close with one box last year. <laughs> But I got the message on December 1st that it arrived on December 1st. So we were very happy about that. It was just the one box. This is not just a box of yarn and little gifty type items. This is a month long experience. So I strongly suggest that you set it aside when it arrives so you can open it as it's intended, which is as a daily experience through the month of December to New Year's Eve. If you would like to open it together, I open each packet daily through the month along with Jana Knits as part of our Woolly Winter Countdown on her YouTube channel, Pearl Together. Be sure to join us there each morning of December with that day's packet in hand. Again, the boxes will go on sale this Saturday, April 13th at noon Eastern time, 5 British time. You can order it at store.ithoughtinewhow.com. I will make sure there is a link in the show notes. So if it's after the launch time, look there and click over. Once they're gone, they're gone. I know some hand dyers who do holiday boxes, they release their boxes and then like a month later say, hey, I was able to put together five more, go get them. I cannot do that with these boxes. I am partnered with 13 companies to curate this experience. There are just too many moving parts. So get to the site as soon as you can to place your order to avoid disappointment. Finally, just a reminder that there will not be another episode until May. In addition to the major assignment I mentioned, there are some end of semester stuff for my kids, and then I will be heading back to Shetland. And on the way, I will be stopping in Edinburgh for a few days to go to the Woolly Good Gathering. This is a brand new wool festival launching in Edinburgh. It's happening April 26th and 27th at Summer Hall, and there will be a marketplace and lessons and talks about dyeing and knitting and crochet and cyanotypes and dorset button making and Shetland lace and more. Many of the people you have met through interviews on the show will be there vending or teaching or just being there, so it will be a great place to meet them in person. I will spend most of the event in the marketplace, hosting a booth of goods stocked by four Shetland makers. Donna Smith is sending her DK weight and lace weight yarns. Uradale is sending their organically grown and processed jumper weight wool. Papperwork Furniture will be sending a selection of his tools for knitters. And Mella Handmade Soaps will be sending down her knitter's hand balm, as well as a selection of other Treat Yourself products. So come find me there and put your hands on some of these delicious wools and products and say hello. I hope to meet you. In the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review the show in the app you use to download it. And I'd love it if you'd share the episode with a friend. The show notes are where you will find links to things mentioned in the show, so be sure to check those out. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on X where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. <laughs>